welcome some of all of you and especially uh, people who have come from uh, Nagarjuna College. Uh, we have a professor who has been in uh, NIT Suratkal for more than 30 years. Uh, sir, I think I don't remember. Dr. Hanifar. Dr. Hanifar. Uh, he is here. We have uh, Professor uh, Vishwanath who is the director of uh, the MBA program at uh, Bhakti Vidya Bhavan. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Ramesh Babu who is a Guinness record holder for the highest number of records in India. Ramesh Babu. His, his daughter incidentally studies here in uh, Kasset. And uh, we have of course a lot of India. So welcome to our group. I hope uh, we will have an enjoyment. Thank you. Suggested to Veda Vyasa that there are 50, everybody should have one of the 50 things that you should do before you die. And uh, one of my uh, items on the list is that I should give a public lecture in Bangalore on uh, the work that I have done. Uh, so uh, that is not going to happen today, uh, but uh, I'm still going to give you a very popular lecture on uh, popular means that uh, varies on a level which is uh, non technical on 100 years of superconductivity. Veda Vyas, uh, thank you Veda Vyas for the very generous uh, introduction. Uh, I don't think 50% uh, of what you said is true, but uh, anyway. Um, he chose to highlight uh, one of my uh, more recent uh, uh, work, hydrogen, that is not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but uh, it's interesting that he chose to do, highlight that because uh, it is uh, related to what I'm going to say in the beginning of this talk. Um, uh, because although we made the claim, and this is true, that uh, we have a record hydrogen storage uh, uh, material, we have discovered that, uh, but the real application of that in real life, that is, how does it impact human life, uh, we are still very far away. Uh, we are still extremely far away, and a lot of still fundamental research and understanding has to be done before that becomes a reality. So I think that leads to my next uh, uh, talk here which is 100 years of supertemporality. The 100 is significant because uh, you will see towards the end of my talk uh, that there are applications. Uh, Foundation. 
to build the knowledge that goes underneath um, what happens later on. And that is where colleges like this, uh, I think, are very important um, in trying to impart this knowledge for, to young people and uh, impart the importance of uh, uh, curiosity and uh, uh, trying to learn new things. So that is uh, with that brief introduction, so let me just go to the talk. I will talk about the discovery, the initial results, and then I will try to give you a overview of uh, the theoretical understanding that has uh, existed until today. And then I will uh, uh, mention the more modern developments uh, which are challenging this uh, understanding and perhaps the uh, explanation of uh, uh, the more modern development will lead to uh, further development of these uh, subjects. So, uh, uh, I hope everybody ha uh, has some idea of uh, uh, what superconductivity is and what I will mean for that. Um, uh, it is a very special property of uh, uh, metals. Uh, so far we believe that it's only metals that can uh, superconduct. And uh, what do I mean by superconduct? It means that uh, these metals, they lose um, their ability to... Uh, uh, they lose their ability uh, to show any resistance to the flow of electrons. Uh, I'll explain that a little bit better as we go along. And the person who discovered this uh, phenomenon of superconductivity exactly 100 years ago was uh, uh, E.K. Camelin Honest. So he, people call him just Honest, Camelin Honest. And uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, today we have uh, in the university environment in which I work, uh, I don't have a technician, uh, I work with students, and students, um, at least in the American system, uh, even here of course it works that way, uh, have taken over the role of the technician. So, so it's an apprenticeship uh, kind of an arrangement where the student learns from the teacher. And uh, this photograph is very telling, it's telling in many ways. Um, uh, first of all, you recognize the uh, posture of, this is Camille in Holtz, so he has his hand here has a stomach sticking out like this. So, you don't have to know, I, I did not have shown you this picture. You could have guessed who is the boss and who is the uh, technician, uh, just by looking at this. Um, so, he was one of the earliest uh, uh, members of this uh, class of uh, uh, great uh, organizers. He was not only a scientist, but he was also a great organizer of science, in the sense that he was able to get a lot of money for his research and build up the facilities. And this is one of the key requirements why great research can happen. So you need to have these facilities. And that is what we see in the background. This is 100 years ago, so you can imagine you know, what was there 100 years ago. Uh, it's fairly sophisticated instrumentation by today's standards. It appears like nothing but 100 years ago, it was the state of the art instrumentation. And obviously that requires funds and money, and he was able to do that. And other examples that people who study physics would have come across names like Rutherford and Nico Fermi and so on. Um, these are people who came later, but uh, one of the earliest generations of uh, experimental uh, people who put together a large facilities to do uh, research was Campbell and Ox. So what did he discover? Well, he built up all of those facilities. Um, he had one goal in mind, uh, which was most of you would have studied uh, uh, the law of perfect, uh, law, uh, law of perfect gases. So that is PV equals RT. So most of you are familiar with that equation. And uh, uh, there were, if you take oxygen or nitrogen, if you cool it, um, uh, room, uh, uh, take a certain volume and cool it, uh, the pressure will go down. And uh, you can ask if I keep cooling it, uh, will the pressure ultimately go to zero? Um, and uh, uh, so uh, people were interested in uh, exploring those kinds of laws and in particular we're finding out if that uh, gas uh, became a liquid. And there were some gases uh, that were uh, identified as permanent gases uh, like argon and neon. So these are the gases uh, that have a completely filled shell. So therefore there is no interaction between the atoms of the, of the gas and therefore they don't condense. And helium was one of those permanent gases, uh, which remained as a gas for a very long time. 
uh, they were not able to condense it into a liquid. So Canaling Honest actually was in the business of trying to condense all these gases into liquids. And uh, once he had achieved the condensation of helium into liquid at very low temperatures, that happens <laughs> Uh, 4.2 degrees Kelvin. So what does Kelvin mean? Kelvin means that we start counting the temperature from a certain point which we call as absolute zero. So what is the absolute zero of temperature? I mean you know what is the zero of temperature on the centigrade scale. Uh, you also know the zero of temperature in the Fahrenheit scale. Uh, minus uh, uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is zero degrees centigrade. Uh, but <coughs> That is a relative scale of temperature, that is just for us human beings. Uh, but if you want to look at nature uh, uh, as a whole, then you have to have a temperature scale that nature likes. And what is the temperature scale that nature likes? It is called as the uh, uh, absolute scale of temperature. And in that scale of temperature, there is a, a zero, which is absolute zero. And um, uh, the way you understand absolute zero, is that um, all motion ceases at absolute zero. So if you look at room temperature, you have air molecules that are going around everywhere, and they are not stopping, they are going uh, uh, constantly moving, and the reason they are constantly moving is because they have thermal energy. So they have uh, a kinetic energy which is coming from just the temperature, fact that it is at room temperature. So if you cool it to absolute zero, then that motion will stop and everything will become steady. Uh, uh, steady. So, um, so 4.2 degrees above absolute zero, uh, when he cooled mercury, uh, mercury, why mercury? Mercury is because uh, it is one of the purest elements that he could get. Uh, even today it is a liquid form at room temperature and you can get it in a very pure form. Uh, so he took that and he cooled it and all of a sudden he saw that the resistance uh, and I'll explain in a minute what the, what resistance means, uh, went to zero. So this is, uh, you can see, this is its actual data points. So it went to zero. This is the vertical axis resistance, and that's the horizontal axis of the temperature. So um, within a few years, this is the first part of my talk, early studies on superconductors. Within a few years, uh, other metals were discovered also to behave in the same manner, the resistance went to zero. But it took 22 years after these initial discoveries, 1911 to 1933, before the next major effect associated with this superconductivity was discovered. So this is called as the Meissner effect. Okay, and I'll explain what Meissner effect is in just a minute. So, um, so let's look at the periodic table. Um, this again, uh, there's a very telling statement that I can make here. Uh, mercury, of course, was the first one. Uh, you, you look at iron. So, what is iron? Can anybody tell me what iron is? What property does iron have? It's a magnet. So, next one, nickel is also a magnet. And uh, niobium, uh, all of these numbers here, uh, you can see mercury is 4 degrees above, 4 degrees Kelvin. That is the temperature at which the resistance becomes zero. And um, there are many other metals, uh, tantalum, 4 Kelvin, tungsten also becomes uh, zero resistance, but very low temperature. And uh, uh, this is titanium or something, it's 11 degrees Kelvin, that's very high. Uh, so uh, there are two circles on this graph, so on this periodic table. So just by looking at this, you can make a statement uh, as human beings, we are very, very familiar with magnetism. Everybody plays with magnets, and for the simple reason that it exists at room temperature, so people are familiar with it. But if you look at the periodic table, there are only two or three elements that are magnets on their own. So these are cardinal magnets, nature made them. But there are many more superconductors, but people don't know much about superconductors. And I'll try to explain. Okay, so let's talk about resistance. Also, there's a cartoon there about resistance. So, what is resistance? It's uh, uh, taught in elementary courses. Everybody knows what this law is. So, what is this law? 
or small. So what uh, uh, what does this law tell you? It tells you that if I apply a voltage difference across a wire and uh, um, um, I will get a certain amount of current and that current is inversely proportional to the resistance. So larger the resistance, the lower the amount of current that I'm going to get. So if I make R equal to zero, just from Ohm's law, uh, not that Ohm's law is valid all the time, Ohm's law is just a law. That's, it's valid when it is valid. It is not valid all the time. Uh, uh, I can explain that more later. Uh, so if you have uh, uh, zero resistance, this tells you the current will become infinite. So is that really what is going to happen? Uh, another way of saying this is that uh, it is a linear relationship. So if I increase the voltage, I'm going to get a, a, a current that I already said. Uh, another way of uh, saying this is that, um, looking at this, is that uh, all metals, uh, they are they behave like metals because they have electrons. And these electrons, of course, all atoms have electrons, uh, but um, certain uh, elements, um, the, like the metals, uh, the electrons are what we call as free electrons. That is, uh, the atom is willing to give away its outermost electron uh, to uh, participate uh, in uh, carrying the electricity. Um, if you take a piece of sand particle, silicon oxide, uh, there, uh, the electrons, uh, uh, they are not free, they, they don't, uh, uh, if you apply an electric field uh, in a sand particle, nothing will happen. Uh, if you apply an electric field in a piece of copper wire, a current will start to flow. Uh, why is that? Because the electrons in copper are free, uh, they are not rigidly bound to the uh, atom. So, this is the microscopic uh, view of uh, uh, resistance. So, you have uh, these free electrons, uh, which uh, on their own, so it's like molecules in air, if you don't do anything, they are just going around everywhere, it's called Brownian motion. Uh, and the same kind of motion uh, is exhibited by electrons in the copper, except you don't see it, and it's happening inside. And uh, the electrons are bouncing around, and, and when you apply an electric uh, voltage or an electric field, uh, they will still bounce around, but on the average, they will acquire a velocity going in one direction, and that is what gives you this current, uh, electric current. So I've just shown that here, so this is the electric field, and J is actually the current density, it is the current divided by the area of cross-section of this wire, which we call the current density. So um, I'm going to introduce just one equation in this talk, and this is the only equation. So uh, rho is what is not the resistance, but it is normalized. So it is you, you divide out all the geometric factors, and you arrive at a quantity called as resistivity. Everybody here knows about resistivity. Okay. So this is the resistivity. The inverse of resistivity is the conductivity. So I'm not going to derive this equation, but I'm just going to explain this. So n is the number of electrons per unit volume in this piece of copper that I had before. So imagine one cubic centimeter of uh, copper wire, and n is the number of electrons in that copper wire. n times e is the amount of charge that is in that <coughs> copper uh, uh, volume, and a tau is some kind of a time. That is the time that it takes for the electron to go from there to there. So we call these, so every time the electron decides to change direction, we call that as a scattering event. So, so it comes here and it scatters and goes off in a different direction. It scatters again and goes off again. So the amount of time that it takes to go straight without scattering is called as the time top. And then is the mass of the electron. So what this equation is telling you is that somehow if I make this um, uh, tau very, very large, in other words, if I go back to this picture and prevent the electrons from going scattering, so in other words, if they travel a straight path for a longer period of time, then the conductivity will be higher. So conductivity higher means resistance is lower. So uh, if I make tau equal to infinity, um, there is zero resistance. The resistance is possible in principle, so that's what that equation is telling us. Tau tends to infinity. Uh, when does that happen? Uh, it 
might happen, you would think, uh, this was one of the original motivations for Kamenling on us, that when the absolute temperature goes to zero, it might, they didn't know that for sure, but they had some reasons to suspect that it might happen, and I'll tell you in a minute what, what that was. So they suspected that tau could go to infinity at t equal to zero. So I think that plot is probably here in the first part. I didn't put that one. So why did they suspect that? Okay, it is here. Uh, why did they suspect that tau would go to infinity? If you take any uh, uh, metal at room temperature, the conduct room temperature will be way out here somewhere, and you can see this is this is the this is the region before it becomes superconducting. This is the transition where it goes to zero. So here it is going up. So if you go to room temperature, it's going to go way up there. So uh, they had done measurements out here at room temperature, and they had observed that the electrical resistance of materials decreased as a function of temperature. And most of you would have studied this. It's called as the temperature coefficient of resistance. And uh, uh, when you uh, so there was an expectation that if you continue to cool, it will ultimately go to zero. So that was what they were hoping it would have. But it didn't do that. It went suddenly to zero. So now we have this, at least this hypothesis, then uh, it goes to uh, uh, absolute zero, resistance can go to zero. There's a possibility, and, and we have seen it also experimentally. Now uh, I'm going to try to explain in the next few minutes. If you don't understand it, don't worry about it. Uh, you can still appreciate a lot of things. So I'm going to uh, try to explain that um, having resistance equal to zero is not a sufficient condition for what we for the phenomenon that we call as superconductivity. So what do we mean by sufficient? Everybody do mathematics and you study, do theorems and you study sufficient and necessary conditions and things like that. So here also we have sufficient necessary conditions. So what is the, uh, we are going to do a, what I call as a thought experiment. So what is the thought experiment? So we are going to start with a material uh, which is a metal, this green, this blue uh, object here. And we are going to generate a magnetic field, the red ions or the magnetic field. And I should have put the magnetic field outside the ball also, but I didn't do it. So let's imagine it's there outside. And I'm going to start from room temperature, some temperature near room temperature. And the resistance is not zero, it's greater than zero. We all know that. So and then I'm going to, this is the thought experiment, I'm going to cool it. So when I cool it, I'm going to change the temperature, right? So I'm going to keep the magnetic field the same. The magnetic field is coming from a magnet which is outside of this metal. So the magnet doesn't change. So it's, that, its temperature doesn't change. Its magnetic field doesn't change. So that remains the same. And the temperature, I'm going to cool. And I'm going to go below that temperature where the resistance is supposed to go to zero. And the resistance goes to zero. Then I'm going to ask, what happened to this picture here? So what happened to my... Uh, metal which has a magnetic field inside it. Remember, the magnetic field has gone inside this metal. Well, the answer is nothing happened. The magnetic field stays inside the metal. So this is one experiment. So where we have taken a, a, what we in, in proper dynamics we call as a path. What is the path we have taken? The path we have taken is the magnetic field is constant. We have only changed the temperature. So we have taken a path in along the temperature axis and arrived at this is the initial state and we have arrived at the final state. We are going to do an experiment in a different way. We are now going to start from zero magnetic field, same temperature, room temperature, Tem because the temperature is high, the resistance is not zero. So we are going to start from a different initial state. It's different because the magnetic field is zero. I don't have the magnetic field there, and I'm going to cool, and I'm going to arrive at a final state, and I'm going to try to put the magnetic field. So I'm going, when I try to put the magnetic field, I have to put the magnetic field from an outside magnet. So the magnetic field has to slowly start from zero, and it has to be ramped up to whatever value that I want, B equals B zero. And 
Now the resistance has gone to zero because I have pulled it in zero magnetic field. The resistance has gone to zero. There is no magnetic field inside this material. And when you have no resistance in a metal, um, uh, you try to change the magnetic field. Uh, what will happen? Can anybody guess? When you, it doesn't matter whether the metal has zero resistance or not. So if I take any any loop of copper wire and I try to change the magnetic field that is going through the loop of copper wire, what will what will the loop of copper wire do? <coughs> What? Generate current. Generate current. And this is called as what law is it? This is called as Lenz's law or Faraday's law. This is the law of induction. So what this material will do is it will try to prevent the magnetic field from going into this material by setting up currents that are going in the opposite way which will cancel the outside magnetic field that I'm trying to apply. So this is the statement of Faraday's law or Lenz's law. And so Lenz's law, the system responds by trying to oppose what you are trying to do. And what is it you are trying to do? You are trying to put the field inside this and it is going to oppose it and cancel the field. And those currents, because the resistance is zero, will flow for a long time. Because there is no resistance, the current will just keep going and it will always oppose what you are trying to do. So, I started with two separate uh, uh, initial conditions, but I tried to arrive at the same final condition. I am not able to do that uh, uh, because, because of the <coughs> property resistance equal to zero. So, in order for this final state to be the same as that final state, See, if you, look at, if you look at all the quantities on this side, B equals B0, and I have to put B equals B0 here because that's the outside magnetic field, and T less than T is R equals 0. All the conditions are the same on the right hand side, but the picture that I have here is different. So, therefore, that is not possible according to thermodynamics. So, you cannot have a, a final state which is too different. So, the only way that the final state can be the same is for the magnetic field inside this metal uh, to be expelled out spontaneously. So in other words, if I started with a magnetic field here and cooled it uh, to less than the temperature where it becomes a resistance equal to zero, then it should automatically push out all the magnetic field. And that's the, that's the explanation of the Meissner effect. So in order to have a superconductor, it is not sufficient to have zero resistance. It is necessary also to have this Meissner effect, which is called as perfect diamond. Okay, so here's the experimental demonstration of the Meissner effect. We do this in Parandakaj and we teach all other graduates. We do this experiment quite frequently and uh, uh, because liquid nitrogen is readily available, that's all you need. If you have liquid nitrogen, you can do this experiment. Um, so if this is a magnet which is floating on top of uh, the superconductor, and uh, because the magnet is producing a magnetic field, which would would have gone into the superconductor, the magnetic field lines would have gone into the superconductor, but because uh, it is superconducting, it does not go into the field, and the field lines have to cross around around that creates this limitation phenomenon. Um, so, uh, I have to, yeah. uh, so uh, there are many uh, explanations for this uh, uh, model. Uh, superconductivity, uh, is everybody with me so far? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, this experiment, this uh, phenomenon of superconductivity uh, had to be explained and uh, that was 1911, 1920 uh, was the beginning of another field of physics, I don't, clearly don't have the time to explain all of those things. It is the field of quantum physics. Quantum physics was just being born and people were explaining all kinds of things with quantum physics and they wanted to explain superconductivity also and some of the earlier attempts used what is called as the two fluid model and this is an example of a type of theory in Whenever you discover things, uh, there are two types of approaches 
uh, people take in physics, which is uh, one is called as the phenomenological approach, and the other one is called as the first principles or the microscopic approach. In the phenomenological <coughs> approach, you make a lot of assumptions. There, the theory does have predictive power. Any theory, the value of the theory comes from its ability to predict things. So if you're able to predict things, which you can go and verify in the lab later on, it is that much more powerful. Um, so the phenomenological theories, they make assumptions and nobody questions the assumptions. If you discover something that uh, it is not proved by the phenomenological theory, then that means the assumption is wrong and you have to go back and fix it. Um, the microscopic theories, you start with very few assumptions or with zero assumptions in many times and then you predict what will go or happen. So this two fluid uh, model, the assumption is that the electrons that I described to you, the free electrons, they um, are not all the same in the metal. So, so here are you know, millions and zillions of electrons and this theory said that uh, you can split the electrons into two parts. One is uh, what, call, what are called superconducting electrons and the other one is normal electrons. And if you are above at some you know, high temperature there that I showed you, you have only normal electrons and when you reach this superconducting transition temperature DC, you all of a sudden pick up these uh, superconducting electrons which give you this effect. So that's one of the theories. That, so it was kind of a hodgepodge theory which was not really... Um, but the real explanation of this didn't come until you know people of this quality tried their hand. They couldn't explain it. The hardest problem is <coughs> understanding uh, solid state physics. And uh, uh, it was finally cracked in 1955 or so, after 45 years uh, after the discovery. There was a theory which people believed in, and that theory had a lot of predictive power. So a lot of experiments were done, and these three, three people won the Nobel Prize. This is uh, John Bardeen, uh, uh, Schrieffer and Cooper. Uh, this man here is one of the few, I think, Vishwanath is an expert on these kinds of numbers. He won two Nobel Prizes. <coughs> Um, uh, what is the theory? So let's talk about the theory, just uh, a, a gist. Uh, the theory, uh, it's a quantum theory. Uh, I, I'm not going anything about quantum physics, so, but you know, I will explain in two, the three sentences what this theory is. Um, it's a radically new vision of the superconducting state and what, what, does, what does this theory say? It, it established for the first time the concept of what is called as a Cooper pair. So, what is a Cooper pair? Uh, okay, I'll explain. So, Cooper pair means everybody knows there are ions. So, these big uh, circles here are the ions in the atom, in the in the metal, and the, the red balls here are electrons. Electrons, of course, will get attracted to the ions uh, so, and to complete the, the atom. Uh, in a metal, I told you the electrons are free, so that this electron from this ion, in principle, can move around everywhere, anywhere. Um, uh, and electrons uh, uh, will repel other electrons as they are moving around, because they are negatively charged. They are not going to be attracted to each other; they will repel from each other. So that's well known, Coulomb's law. Uh, but this theory proposed that uh, if you have a, what is called as an electron-ion interaction. So the electrons are moving around. It can be explained in simple language. I'll try to do that. So electrons are moving around, and then during one instant of time, one electron will come near one positive ion. So it will get attracted to that positive ion. So let's say it gets attracted to this positive ion. And within that same instant of time, another electron will come around and will also get attracted to that positive ion. So if I now remove the positive ion, and just look at what the two electrons did, then it feels as if the two electrons were attracted to each other, right? So even though the electrons repel each other, in the presence of this positive ion, uh, uh, which we can somehow remove later, uh, the electrons will attract to each other. So two electrons attracting each other is called as a Cooper pair, because of Cooper, he came up with that idea. Uh, so if you have, the idea is that uh, if you have, go back to that picture of, uh, um, of uh, uh, this picture where I had the electrons uh, scattering. So I had this picture where electrons were scattering from uh, different, why do they scatter? They scatter because there are 
fluorine atoms, no metal is pure uh, because there are other um, uh, ions uh, which are vibrating around and they, they bump into these other ions, so that's why they scatter. So these are single, single electrons which are easy to scatter with and if you form a Cooper pair, then you have to scatter two of them at the same time. So not only two, but uh, in that BCS theory it says that uh, it's, it's not just two because uh, there is a certain length over which, let us say 10 to the 7 million or uh, 10 to the 8 electrons, they are all um, constantly exchanging pairs. So it's not a permanent marriage, it is, it is a temporary marriage of the two electrons and they exchange pairs to the next instant. And because they are doing this in a constant fashion, uh, a regular fashion, uh, if you want to scatter a one electron in order to cause the resistance, uh, you have to scatter a million electrons because they are all married to each other. And um, so that's the essence of the theory, so it's very hard to do that. So, and that is why the resistance goes to zero. So that's the essence of the theory. Uh, there were other predictions that came uh, which were uh, uh, verified. One of the very important predictions is uh, what is called as a Josephson current. So what is a Josephson current? It's a current that can happen in a superconductor even without applying any voltage. So in, order, in a regular piece of wire, you have to connect a battery to send a current. Uh, to get a Josephson current, you don't need to apply any voltage. The current will automatically go. So uh, that was another prediction that was also very so this, this, this great success of this theory, so here's a cartoon, uh, nobody expects the superconducting state, so that's Cameron and Hollis, so he discovered superconductivity. Uh, then uh, there was another famous scientist in the US called you know, Matthias, uh, he said well, it, it appears in elements, alloys, and compounds, so he showed did a lot of work, and it appears in organic compounds, now it has been shown it appears in oxides, um, it appears in borides, uh, borocarbides, I should put it here because the first borocarbide superconductor was discovered in India in TIFR. Uh, it appears, looks like it appears everywhere. So, uh, magnets, there are only few magnets, there are so many superconductors now that uh, it was a very, very rich field <coughs> in terms of the materials science and in terms of the physics that goes on. And uh, just as a commentary, uh, as you look at this, this is the time period, 100 years. And of course, in the beginning, all the superconductors were elements, so people <coughs> pick items from the periodic table and do experiments on that. And then later on, they go and work with more complicated things of so two elements, then three elements, four elements. And now, um, if you look at the highest temperature superconductor, it has five elements. So that's because we are exhausted the space that we, which we convert. Now, having said that, that is not quite true because just about 10 years ago, I mean, I'm telling this for young people, you can still make discoveries. This is a garden variety material which you can buy from, uh, from any chemical company. Okay, MG, because <coughs> they care about this material and it took until 2003 or so for somebody to find superconductivity in this. The people who found superconductivity in this became very famous all of a sudden. And now there are companies in, the, in Europe and not in the US so much which are trying to make wires out of this material. So things can still happen uh, if, you, if you look in the right place. Okay, um, so this is uh, 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 this family of uh, <coughs> oxides. I will say a few more words about this. So all the Temperature, superconductors which are relatively high temperature, we are not at room temperature, room temperature is 300 Kelvin, but we are not that far right? away, I mean, maybe, maybe somebody will get lucky and have a material there in the near future, and, and uh, this of course tells you the, the, the liquids that come back. And uh, there are a lot of interesting things I can say, but there is no time, uh, recently diamond was discovered to be a superconductor, you know, all the ladies maybe. Hmm. We, uh, well, of course, you can't play a super conducting ring, right? <laughs> um, uh, okay, so here, uh, here I want to say some sociological remarks here. So this previous um, uh, graph it tells you, so you can ask the question, how did anybody discover this? So how, did, how did they really figure out? How, how did they really come to find this material? I mean, it looks so complicated. I mean, there are 100 elements in the periodic table. 
10 to the power 5, which is you know, the number of combinations that you can put, is, is incredible. How does anybody figure out how a material is superconducting? So this is how it works. So it's not just for superconductivity, it's for any, if you want a new type of semiconductor, you want a new type of a solar cell, you want a new type of a, a material that uh, is uh, resistance to corrosion, whatever you are interested in, in, in terms of creating new materials, and that happens all the time in different parts of the world, and the, the basic, there are a bunch of people called chemists, and they, their only interest is to make new stuff, and they get thrilled when they make something that didn't exist before, that's their life. And, and they make hundreds per year and they publish it. They publish, some of them publish the structure of this material. They do what are called X-ray diffraction and they figure out where the atoms are in, in, in the new material that they make. And then people like me, they spoon through these and then we pick what looks promising out of these hundreds per year that come out, one or two or maybe ten. Uh, materials will be selected and their properties will be studied in further detail for whatever specific uh, purpose we are interested in. And then out of this 10 or so, one or two, there will be physicists who will ask very deep questions and they will, they, they are not interested in any materials, they want perfect single crystals of these materials and then they study uh, further uh, uh, experiments on that. And eventually out of this some will move forward uh, and, and get into R&D, you know, somebody will discover, oh, this material has this particular property, uh, I'm going to explain.